Would you like Groundhog Day so far? Yeah. We have to thank our major sponsor, Home State Bank. There's a long list of other sponsors, but Home State Bank has been with us for many years as our major sponsor. We have to thank the city of Woodstock and the staff here at the Opera House who helped with so many of our different events. Without the city's help, none of this would be here for you. Um, how many are first timers for Groundhog Day? Oh. This side, where are you from? Other states, South states. So, the fame of Groundhog Day in Woodstock has spread a bit as you come from across the country and I know we've got people from Spain and Germany and I forget where else. So we're glad you're all here. We have several other events yet to come. Okay. Stephen's going to talk. He'll take some questions at the end. And when he's done here, he will be downstairs in the community room with a book signing. So come down. You can buy one of his latest book. You can get it autographed if you like. Afterwards, uh, two blocks south of the square, I think Blue Lotus Temple, okay. there is Bingo at 5 and Trivia at 6.30. There is a pub crawl tonight. If you want to take part in that, meet on the patio of the public house at 6. And if you want to do the Groundhog Day thing and relive each day over and over again, it starts over again tomorrow with Breakfast at the Moose <laughs> and a free showing of the movie Groundhog Day at 10. <laughs> Uh, I should mention, since many of you for, are from out of town, there is a, a group called Real Woodstock. And they have a Facebook page and website and all. And it's all about promoting things Woodstock, not just Groundhog Day, but many other things that happen here. The Farmer's Market on the Square, a thing called Fair Diddly, uh, band concerts in the summer in the park. Lots of things going on in Woodstock throughout the year. Uh, the Christmas lights that you saw this morning lighting the square. Those are lit in a wonderful ceremony, the Friday of Groundhog Day weekend. And they leave the lights up for us. Oh, sorry, thanks, Amy. <laughs> they leave those up for us through, through Groundhog Day. So it was fun having the groundhog see his shadow and think spring. This, this last week was... <laughs> Uh, thankfully, it was short. I did not, didn't see it yet, but it's pretty good. Uh, but it'll, it'll be nice to, to put that harsh weather behind us and move on. So moving on. This week, was, was it was the perfect storm. With Groundhog Day falling on Saturday this year, having a 50-degree swing in our favor, temperature-wise, and the icing on the cake. Having Stephen couple up. relentless the last couple days. He has not turned a person away for a smiling picture. Standing out there in, this morning after the ceremony in a foot of snow. He's from California. Standing there with his cold feet in the snow. But he was smiling through all the pictures. And he's got loads of stories. So I'm going to get out of the way and let Stephen talk. talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's another one there. Uh, I ask a preemptory question sometimes. How many of you have listened to my podcast, The Tobolowski Files? So there's, yeah, about 10. <laughs> no, it's mainly a blank slate. That's good. Just in, ca in case you want to refer, uh, what, uh, we'll get to why I wrote The Tobolowski Files. But in the Tobolowski Files, the episode on Groundhog Day is called the classic. So later, if you want to Google Tobolowski Files classic, you can listen to uh, probably an hour's worth of Groundhog Day stories uh, that I recorded. But we'll get, we'll get to that uh, later. One of the stories that I, I mentioned there is, is one of Groundhog Day has been such a strange experience for me. Just. As an actor, you have lots of strange experiences. But in Groundhog Day, everything was strange. <laughs> this, I want to tell you the story of how I got the part. 
which is very strange. So I was working on a movie. I, I was on location in Paris, uh, California. <laughs> Sometimes I just like to try to pretend I'm John Travolta. You know. Paris, California is the hot, they advertise as the hot air balloon capital of California. As if, you know, every state has a hot air balloon capital. It's about two hours from Los Angeles. And I, I in this movie, Calendar Girl, I play a gangster type guy with a brother who is deaf and mute, uh, who was played by Kurt Fuller, a wonderful actor who was on The Good Wife and all, all sorts of other shows, too. And to learn the part, they taught me sign language of the deaf, and they, ter they, they taught Kurt sign language of the deaf, too. So he would ask me what people were saying, and then I would translate the script to them, and curious, you know, Right after I did Groundhog Day and did these classes is when Seinfeld asked me to audition for Tor Ekman. So I said, well, I can do, what if I did signs for everything Tor said? So one thing led to another. So Kurt and I were, were playing brothers, and I got the audition for Groundhog Day. So I drove the two hours back to Los Angeles, met Harold Ramis, did my NED, and like I mentioned before, I was my performance was big enough to play in the Roman Colosseum. I, I think I was like unzipping Harold's pants and shining his shoes. It was terrible. It was terrible. And, and, and I drove back to Paris because we were still shooting. And for the only time in my life, they put me in a room on location with another actor, with Kurt. So Kurt and I were sharing the same room. Right, we had the two queen beds, and at night it was like we were at summer camp. And they, they turn out the light, you know, we turn out the lights, and Kurt's in the dark. He said, "So, uh, you know, you got anything coming up?" And I know the one thing actors hate is to hear that somebody else had an audition. The only thing that can make an actor happy is if you answer that question and say, "Kurt, you know, actually, I'm leaving the business. I'm going to open a sandwich shop. I'm done." So I just, I didn't say anything. I just said, uh, nothing, Kurt, you know, the same old, same old. I said, how about you? He said, well, actually, I do have something big coming up. Uh, Harold Ramis is a friend of mine. <laughs> and uh, they wrote a part for me in the new Bill Murray movie, uh, Groundhog Day. And I'm playing this crazy insurance salesman, <laughs> Ned Ryerson. Now at this point, I'm lying in bed. My brain is exploding. I realize that I am part of a tragic tale. And I don't know who the victim is going to be, but it's going to be one of the two of us. I didn't say anything, and I get a phone call from my agent. I got a call back, which meant I was going back again. So I didn't say anything to Kurt, because I thought, hey, you know, they wrote the part for Kurt. He said he's been rehearsing it for the last month, doing readings with Bill and everything. So I drive the two hours back to California, uh, to Los Angeles, audition with Harold, drive the two hours back, and in the car ride back, my cell phone, which in those days was about this big, you know, and I answered it. And it was my agent saying, you have the part of Ned Ryerson. Yes. I get back to Paris, and Kurt got that phone call, too, from his agent. So he is furious. He is so hurt. He's been so betrayed. And, and he doesn't know in which direction to vent. Uh, he didn't know if it was me or, her, or someone betrayed him. So angry, eyes filling with tears. Fortunately, he was playing a mute. Uh, <laughs> he couldn't say anything. Uh, didn't say anything in our pillow talk at night either. So as soon as that, that movie ended, I left and came up to Chicago and started shooting Groundhog Day. 
the movie finished shooting, and we were going to do our premiere in Los Angeles. And I'm walking up to the theater. Um, Andy asked me if I would take her to the premiere because she didn't want guys hitting on her. <laughs> like, I, hey, baby. Can you handle this? <laughs> so we're walking up to the theater, and there is Kurt Fuller standing at the front of the theater. And he said, I'm going to watch the movie with you. <laughs> so Kurt comes in, and we watch Groundhog Day. And we walk out of the theater in silence. And Kurt said, well, you took my part from me, but at least you did a good job. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. And he shook my hands and Exactly. I, I'm with the ah, uh, <laughs> the uh, graciousness, the, again, courage, the class of Kurt Fuller uh, has always been one of the stars I keep in the sky. And I say, I'm going to aim my ship in that direction. Uh, such a magnificent man, such a magnificent actor. So, Kurt, thank you for letting me play your part. <laughs> Terrible. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit how I, I became a writer. Because, yeah. It's, yeah. I know, I know. So in 2000, are there any writers in the house? I just imagine there must, yes, there's one here. Yes, there's, yes, gotcha. Uh, I probably became a writer the same way you guys did, and that is catastrophe. Uh, in 2008, I uh, went horseback riding in Iceland, and I broke my neck in five places riding on the edge of an active volcano. Uh, C2 through C5, two, three, four, five, six. C2 through C6, C six, multiple breaks. And C4, as the pros call it, the one in the middle was crushed. Uh, they get me to the doctor in Iceland. Uh, I, I was going in and out of consciousness. So nobody knew I, how bad off I was. They put me in a truck, drove me a few hours down the mountain to a little local doctor in Iceland. She puts me in a, a neck brace. They drive me to Reykjavik. They do a DVD uh, of, of a CAT scan of my neck which I called Stephen Topolowski's greatest hit. <laughs> I come back to uh, America and go to my doctor and give him Stephen Topolowski's greatest hit. He re-x-rays me, checks my neck, and he's ashen. And he tells me the extent of my injury and said I had a fatal injury, which obviously I did not. <laughs> it was a terrible misuse of the word fatal. Uh, <laughs> So I'm in, I'm in a, a neck brace now, and it's going to take like three and a half months to, to heal. And at first, I thought the pronouncement that I was a dead man walking was kind of terrifying. And then I thought it was kind of funny. And then I found it strangely inspirational. And I was thinking, what if what that doctor said was true? And what if I really died on that mountain in Iceland? What are the stories I didn't tell my two boys about their dad growing up? The stories, you know, I never got a chance to tell them. So I'm in this net brace, and I start writing true stories from my life about the girl I fell in love with when I was eight years old, when she was playing the piano in her bluebird outfit with her ponytail flying. Yeah, it was so good. <laughs> about my first adversaries I had, and, and first jobs, and, and not necessarily uh, the day my mother died. All sorts of stories. And I wrote them for my boys uh, to read. And when I, I did that, uh, a student from Harvard, David Chen, asked if I wanted to record any stories, because he knew I was a storyteller. So I said, sure. So we recorded these stories. He put them on the internet. and. 
And one of the heads of an NPR station, program director, heard them on the internet and wrote me on my email at home and said, can we put your stories on the radio? I said, sure. No money involved. Just, yeah, sure. So then these stories end up on about 12 different NPR stations, and then they start going around the world. And then Simon & Schuster said, can we do a book of your stories? So that's how you get a book published. <laughs> Don't die on the mountain. That's the key to it. So I wrote my, my first book was uh, The Dangerous Animals Club, which, which is basically um, stories of, of the club I had when I was a kid catching uh, poisonous snakes in the river in Texas where I grew up and my mother never knew about it, and falling in love with my girlfriend in college, Beth, who turned out to be uh, Beth Henley, who won the Pulitzer Prize, which is very unusual. <laughs> and then Simon and Schuster said, well, we enjoyed the humor of your stories, uh, but also your stories seem to have a spiritual bent. Is it possible you could write another book of true stories and have it tied together with a spiritual through line? And I said, sure, no problem. <laughs> I had no idea what I was going to write. But if Simon & Schuster says, can you write a book? And you go, oh, yeah, easy. I got that one right here. <laughs> so my editor came out when I was shooting Californication. We were going to shoot some naked scenes that night at a <laughs> swimming pool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the girl, they, they got a body double for uh, Pam Adlon, who played Marcy. And this girl was very nervous because she had never done a naughty scene before. And I had done plenty of them on Californication. And she said, I just have never done a scene with such intimacy. And I said, there's going to be nothing intimate happening here. You're not even going to know we're in the same swimming pool. Don't even worry about it. So anyway, I go see, I, I, I see my editor uh, for dinner. And he, before I go shoot this scene all night, he goes, so how's the spiritual book coming? And I hadn't thought about it at all. And then what came out of my mouth was one of the most fortuitous things I ever said. I said, well, Ben, this is the way I look at it. I think my life and every person's life I've known follows the template of the Old Testament. We all have a genesis. These are the first stories we tell on a first date with first glass of Chardonnay about who we are, where we came from, our family, our aspirations, our terrors. Then we all go into slavery. Uh, we don't build pyramids anymore, but we lose ourselves to first loves, terrible first employments. Some people stay in graduate school for years. <laughs> but then we escape, and in the middle of our lives, we have this Leviticus moment where we say, stop to the universe. This is what I am. And we redefine ourselves. And it was at this point in my life that I got married to Anne. And I had kids. And I came back to Judaism in like a big time way. I, I began to understand that I never really appreciated what all those Bible stories meant when I was a child. And it was just beautiful. And then we're all reshaped by mortality. Like in the book of Numbers, we lose family and friends, the irreplaceable. And we are reshaped by grief. And then finally, if we're lucky, we get to Deuteronomy where we tell our stories to our children. And uh, Ben said, that's great. Great idea for a book. Write that book. So this is this book. <laughs> Again, true stories that I wrote for my boys so they would know more about their father. And uh, curiously, they have not <laughs> looked at these books at all. <laughs> Not listen to the podcast at all. But I would like to uh, do a short bit of a story for you tonight from the Deuteronomy section of the book. I call uh, this story The Spider and the Telescope. Confusion is exciting when you're young. It represents the mysteries to be solved. 
In elementary school, I felt destined to be a scientist. You know, my rabbi always said, when the baby is crying, the baby is really talking to God. Oh, and now he's going to see God. Okay. <laughs> When I was six, my brother and I branched out into the grandest science of them all, astronomy. Studying the heavens was inspiring. It was the only thing we knew that was eternal. My brother had a book on the stars, but the real study of space came courtesy of our Aunt Helen. She sent us the greatest treasure we had as children, a telescope, a little telescope. It was black and brass and slid out into three sections, each one with increasing magnification. I took it out one night. I stood on our driveway to look at the sky. I picked out a star. I decided I would try the three sections individually to test their respective powers. I never got past the first section. I was in awe. I was transported. I saw the star through my eyepiece. It was gigantic. It was round and not five-pointed like the gold stars we got at school. The surface of the star was a blur of blue gas, and it looked like it had vast craters of fire. I ran inside to my bedroom. I turned off the light, jumped into my bed, and pulled out my little notebook my father gave me to draw pictures in, and I began taking notes on my star in the dark, using a flashlight. We always have more faith in things we discover in the dark. It was in the dark I first held Beth's hand in college. It was in the dark that I heard Van Cliburn play the piano and felt connected to some universal truth through the beauty he created. It was in the dark I saw Anne's face in the tomato garden. And it was in the dark by the light of my small flashlight, I drew a picture of my star. I noted its color and the location of its craters. I speculated they were caused by collisions with meteors and other planets. Using my brother's book, I looked up the color blue, and I saw that it meant it was a hot young star. I guessed at the star's temperature. I wrote a one with lots of zeros. I estimated the star's age by writing a one with even more zeros. <laughs> Looking back, writing zeros was always more fun than writing exponents. <laughs> I decided I would dedicate the next several nights to making more findings with the telescope. And I ran into my first problem. In studying the night sky, there were a lot of stars up there I had no way of knowing which star was my star. I stood in the driveway in despair. I had let myself down. I had let down the science of astronomy, but most importantly, I had let down my star. What importance did my little star have except in being observed by me? Now, I couldn't find it. I couldn't give up on it. I put my star on the first level of magnification. I looked in the general vicinity of the sky where I thought it was, and amazingly, there it was. The same blue star with the craters of fire. It was fate. In finding my star, I found my future. I was born to science. Not only did I have the desire and the work ethic, I also had luck on my side. I felt like I was master of the universe. I decided to branch out and explore more stars. I moved my gaze to the right and landed on another sphere. Huh, that was odd. It looked exactly the same as my star. <laughs> it was blue, fiery, had the craters. I moved my gaze to another star. It was the same too. Oh dear, something was wrong. In my brief experience with the world, I knew sameness was a condition created by mankind. It was a row of windows on a skyscraper. It was teachers having pencils honed to the same degree of sharpness. It was students arranged in lines according to their heights and seated in identical desks. Sameness is not a trait of the natural world. 
Frogs, snakes, dogs, cats are all completely different. Trees and flowers are organized by their variation and not prized for their sameness. Stars belong to the natural world. I needed consultation with someone wiser. I went to my brother, Paul. <laughs> Paul left his homework and came outside, took the telescope, looked at the stars with the first degree of magnification, then looked at some other stars. He adjusted the scope to the second and then the third levels of magnification. He stopped. He closed the telescope and handed it back to me. He thought carefully and said, Stevie, you weren't looking at a star at all. The telescope was just out of focus. What, what do you mean? I asked. You were looking at a blur. You can't see the stars even close up with the magnification of this telescope. They're too far away. You could barely see stars with the 200-inch scope at Palomar. So the craters of fire and the color, I said. My brother pondered my problem respectfully. Even at the age of nine, he would never think of kicking anyone in their dream. The findings are inconclusive, he said. <laughs> That's what astronomers would say. They would say, findings inconclusive, and start all over again. He handed me back the telescope. I walked down the hallway to my bedroom, turned on the light, sat on the edge of my bed, took out my star notebook, and wrote in big letters, findings inconclusive. <laughs> I have since learned about the power of discovery. It can extend across decades. Take my star notebook. Even though my findings were based on an out-of-focus blur, several of my conclusions were correct. I deduced that stars were spherical, that they were made of fire. That was right. If I knew how to chart the sky, their location would be correct. As to the color and the craters and the age and the temperature and all of the zeros, I'm afraid that will have to remain in the vast limbo of findings inconclusive. How important is it to be right? Or even more troubling, is it possible to be right at all? How many of the facts in our life do we assume we know with certainty, but if we had a different perspective, we would see we based our beliefs on a blur, on a smear of light we call a star, perhaps science is not truth at all, but it's just an alternate point of view, something in base 10, using models to comfort us with the familiar. For example, for years we were taught that a spider spins a new web every day, and that certain threads are covered with a sticky substance so she can catch her lunch. The spider only puts the substance on certain strands so she can move more easily and quickly across the web and not get stuck. That was our vision of the spider web until a few years ago. Catherine Craig, an evolutionary ecologist at Yale, wondered if we had been operating under the wrong point of view. We always look at the web as people, but we never looked at the web as if we were insects, the spider's prey. Insects have a different system of vision than we do and different from spiders. Insects see a different spectrum of light. Scientists decided for the first time to study the web using an insect's ocular system. And the insects could not see the web at all. The strands vanished, except for the parts of the web that were coated with the sticky stuff. They caught and reflected sunlight. Scientists were taken aback when they saw that the spiders were not leaving some strands uncoated so they could navigate their web. They left them uncoated because they were painting with sunlight. The strands that had the sticky stuff on them when hit by the sun, when viewed through the ocular system and light spectrum visible to an insect, took on the outline of flower petals with the body of the spider at the center of the web becoming the pistol of the flower. It was not science, it was art and perhaps something more. The spider has different eyes than an insect. 
It sees a completely different world. It is painting something it doesn't know, that it can't see, and can only comprehend as a means of catching dinner. It recreates this painting over and over again. If the spider succeeds and creates the illusion of a flower, she'll catch a moth and she will live. If not, she will die. So the finer artist survives. Maybe the connection between the spider and a universe it cannot know or see is no different than me and my telescope. There may have been more truth in my looking at the stars than I suspected. I caught a glimpse of mystery and happily made my notes in the dark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's crazy, huh? The spiders. Hey. Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is open this up to you a little bit. If you have any questions about shows I've done, acting or writing, or God, religion, anything you'd like, uh, if, if you would like to ask me a question, uh, we'll open this up. Yes? You went to Punks Tani for Groundhog Day. Yes. Wow. So I was invited to Punks Tani for Groundhog Day. It was amazing. Completely different than here. Uh, here, it's festive, it's a celebration. Punxsutawney, Groundhog Day celebration happens in a clearing in the mountains. You, you show up there with 16,000 people at 4 a.m. and everybody is silent. It, it's quiet. At, at first they play music, you know, while people are gathering, but once the groundhog thing starts, it becomes almost holy. And I love what my wife says. She, Anne says that it's like everyone is in on the joke. They know that it's not real, but they're good actors. <laughs> they play it for straight, and, and there is an awesomeness to that space when 16,000 people are silent, when they pull out the groundhog and listen to what he has to say. The tension is amazing. And then when they call it out, it's the whole place erupts one way or the other. It, it's terrible. Uh, <laughs> but, but I loved it, and I made the mistake. Uh, someone from the crowd asked me to do the whistling belly button trick. And I did that. And they recorded and put it on the internet so I could never run for public office. <laughs> That's it for me there. Yes, another? Yes. Uh, this stems from my wife knowing that I was happy that everything would possibly meet and greet with you, wanted me to pass along to you that she really loved you in Mississippi Burning, right? Pretty much opposite of your character in yeah. this. Which do you prefer, the more funny or the more dramatic ones? Well, which do you prefer more funny? He was talking about Mississippi Burning, if you couldn't hear there. Uh, they both have their challenges. The, the, Sigmund Freud wrote a book on comedy, of all things, called uh, Jokes and Their Relationship to the Unconscious. I think he wrote it on a series of lectures he did in Munich in like 1905, something like that. And in that, Freud says the essence of comedy is making the meaningful meaningless or the meaningless meaningful. So you have like Monty Python, Ministry of Silly Walks, you take the meaningless and make it meaningful, and you have comedy. And so you have to be aware of that structure when you're performing comedy. In drama, Mississippi Burning, the meaningful is meaningful, and the meaningless is meaningless. So you have to understand that the paths don't really cross. And so in a drama, you have to consider stakes, like how much does this cost you to be involved in this drama? And that is what propels the emotional life of the character, if that doesn't get into the weeds too much. In comedy, no one gets hurt. The, the worst thing that happens in comedy is humiliation. So you, if you think of Groundhog Day, that's exactly, you know, Bill doesn't get hurt when he steps into the water. Watch out for that, you know, it's a doozy. You know? <laughs> 
It's humiliation. And that's what's so funny. That's, it's, it's that we survive. Uh, so I, I like them both. You just have to be aware of the challenges of both to play them. Yes. Wait, wait. Oh, yep, yep, yo. Um, you've had such a long career um, and been able to be in so many television shows and movies and so on. Um, is it because, do you think it's because you focus more on being a character actor as opposed to a lead actor? Or do you think it's because No. I, 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 I hear it. No. I was at the U of I, and uh, you know when you when you're on a young baseball. Let's talk baseball. When your kid's playing baseball, your best player is your pitcher. Yeah. Pitcher is your best hitter. Your best best you know the pitcher is the best. When you are a young actor in college, if you're a good actor, you end up playing the old men. You play the old men. So I played a lot of old men in college and at the U of I. And so I was playing an 86-year-old physicist in uh, Tom Stoppard's Jumpers, and the makeup department just sprayed my hair with streaks and tips every day. Every day for the, th just so it was gray. I looked like either uh, a large transvestite or <laughs> Granny Clampett. Uh, you know, big granny clamp. I, I did not look, I did not look uh, like an old man. But what happened was the day this show ended, I went to the shower, my, my shower to wash out the streaks and tips, and my hair fell out in handfuls. Like I walked through a room of plutonium. It just came out in handfuls, and I was so, I was crushed. I thought, like, this is it for me. And I came out to Los Angeles, and I would see casting directors look at my hairline. You know, they wouldn't look at my, they'd look, yeah, okay, okay. They were casting Grease at the time, the movie Grease. And yeah, okay, yeah, okay. You're not going to have any bald greasers. <laughs> you know, you're gone. So it was crushing. But then I found out that there's only one leading man in a movie, like Bill Murray. One leading man. But every leading man has a doctor, a lawyer, a school principal, an old friend, a police detective that's chasing him down. So there's so many more opportunities to work and act if you're a character actor. And, and it's much more of a detective job than being a lead actor. Lead actors get to do everything in the movie, right? You get to see them wake up in their pajamas and shower and brush their teeth and eat breakfast and the orange juice. When you're a character actor, you've done the same things, but you don't do them on camera. So you have to think through what the life is of your character, and it's very challenging. So I actually think I was lucky. Hey, I was lucky I lost my hair like I was lucky I broke my neck. It's like never trust a catastrophe. Because it will turn into a blessing before your very eyes. So it was one of the best things that happened to me. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Working as Mel Brooks, is it as fun as I think it is? Yeah, I would say yes. He, he is uh, one of the most brilliant life forces I've ever been with. I did uh, space balls with him, and then I did uh, Mad About You. I played another principal, right? There's only one Mel Brooks, but he has a principal. <laughs> he was trying to get his high school degree, and so I got to work with him, and he comes up, oh, Stephen, good to see you again. I mean, he never stops. He never stops, and everybody has to do the lines in the show except him. He could do whatever he wants. And so quite often, your lines don't make any sense with what he ends up saying, but he's Mel Brooks. <laughs> you know, there's, there's nobody like him. He's, he's brilliant, brilliant. Yes. Uh, yes. Was it a coincidence that your character in Glee's name was Ryerson? Or <laughs> <laughs> it was weird, wasn't it? 
And, and I asked Ryan Murphy, I said, is this an ode to Ned? And, and he said, oh, didn't even think of that. <laughs> so I'd, I don't know. I, I, I never got a straight answer on that. It's such a weird name. I would have to think that he was trying to do an echo with that. But no, I don't know for sure. Yes, sir. Uh, one of my favorite characters in the is Jack Barker from Silicon Valley. I was yeah. wondering if you have any stories about working with Mike Judd. Oh, God. S Silicon Valley was fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny. On set, Thomas Middleditch is the funniest human being on earth. And then you start the camera and he, he plays this like Richard, you know? And, and, you know, this kind of uptight kind of guy. But off camera, he's so funny. He keeps everybody in stitches. Uh, I auditioned as Jack Barker and didn't hear anything from anybody for three months. Annie and I were at a film festival in uh, Arkansas, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I get a phone call from my agent and manager. Two, two on the phone. That's real serious. It means either there's a warrant for my arrest or there's <laughs> something big. So it's a conference call. And they said, can you get back to Los Angeles tomorrow? You have a call back for Silicon Valley. And I went, well, I'll get back as soon as I can. I'll get back, and I'll get a prop for you. Just a second. I'll, I'll get back. Oh, let me get this chair. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. OK. So what happens is, when you audition, they put this, this chair here, and they have a camera here, and then they have Mike Judge and Alec Berg and all the executive producers sitting right there, and you have the girl with the camera right here. And so it's intimidating. So I had the flight home to kind of restudy the part because I completely forgot what I was doing. And so what, are there actors up there in the audience? Actors? Yeah, yeah, okay. Whenever you go in on an audition, here's, here's something to remember. Everybody has the part for the first six seconds. <laughs> if you can keep that going for two minutes, you could get the part. So you have to find a way to keep that going. And one way to do it is you nail the first moment, you nail the last moment, everything in the middle doesn't really count, but you make sure that the people know you're not a problem, that you're, you're gonna take care of everything. So I usually try to take over the audition. Like this, I sit down and I say to the camera person, where are you gonna cut me with the camera? Like, where's the camera shot? And they said, oh, we're cutting you here and here, but you go wherever you want. I'm going to follow you. Is it? You're going to follow me. Okay. So <laughs> we start like this, and it was a scene where Jack Barker was getting mad at the guys and being intimidated. So I get up and I started walking toward her, and the producers are there. I started walking toward her, and she's like trying to angle the camera up at me as I go here. I put my hand over the camera, and I pull her around the camera, and I start talking to her this way, and I walk out of the room and down the hall. <laughs> and I leave them in the room with the camera pointing in the air, and the girl I'm doing the audition with, I'm taking over to the elevator down, you know, just down here. And then I come back, and all the guys are laughing. They're all laughing, and uh, we worked for about an hour, and then I leave the audition, and my phone rings, and my manager goes, I don't know what you did, but you got the part. <laughs> so in a way, it's a little like what I do with Harold Ramis with Ned. You know, it was too, too crazy for words. But at least they felt that I was going to be in charge, and they didn't have to worry about me. And, and that is a wonderful group to work with. I don't think I'm going to be able to. This season has been postponed. And so I, there's a good chance I'm not going to be able to do it at all because one day at a time would be shooting during that period of time, and I am obliged to that show. You know, so that would be the show I would have to do. Uh, but it is, it's a wonderful group of people, wonderful group of people, so smart. Mike Judge is so magnificent. And he's a Dallas guy. You know, Mike Judge was from Dallas, like me. You know, we got along. Yeah. Uh, others? 
Yes, sir. Oh, I, wait, what, you'll be next. I'm, I'm, I, this man here is going to kill me if I don't. <laughs> I just wonder, is there any specific story that goes behind how you came up with it? No. Uh, <laughs> it's one of these things. I ask myself a question whenever I do any part. What is my greatest hope? What is my greatest fear? So I read a script and I don't try to have any, I try not to have any judgment about it. I read through and I think my greatest hope is that Phil Connors would remember me and be my friend. And my greatest fear is that I would be neglected and be alone and be put down. So I used this as kind of a template and I began to read through and kind of work through the part and it just started coming out of my mouth bigger and bigger and bigger and I started doing things, you know, with my hands and my, you know, and, you know, all sorts of things started happening. I thought like, oh, am I channeling something? I don't know. And it just started happening and I was having so much fun doing that. Per our conversation, I was thinking, that's one thing that will put uh, directors and casting directors at peace is when the actor appears to be in control and having fun, even if it's completely wrong. So that's what I went with, with the audition. And uh, I, I mentioned at one of our gatherings here, 15 years after we did the show, I went to do a benefit with Danny Rubin in New Mexico, and Harold Ramis was there. So I had the opportunity of revisiting the Kurt Fuller story and asking about that. And I said, Harold, how did I get the part of Ned? How did that happen? And he said, Stephen, I knew the instant you came in the room and you started talking that you were going to be our Ned. I called Bill the instant you left the room and said, Bill, we found our Ned. He's the most obnoxious person I've ever met. <laughs> So, you know, you never, you never know those things. Yes, ma'am. How did you feel coming back to this town after so long? Oh, so many memories. So many memories, and all of them good. And, and you don't get that chance ever really as an actor. You can watch a film you've done before, like Thelma and Louise. I can watch that film and remember things I did and what was happening. But I don't think any of those places still exist. I know for a fact the house that we shot in was torn down when we finished with it because we ruined it. You know. <laughs> uh, but here, to come back here and see the very street where I walked down with, with Bill and to see the courthouse where when I was punched, you know, in the in the in the, the show, you know, I asked Harold Ramis, I said, where do you want me to be looking in terms of the camera before I fall out of frame. And he said, you can do that? I said, well, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to turn and look at whatever you tell me to look at and then fall out of frame. And so he said, courthouse. And the courthouse is still here. <laughs> and and, and it, it, it's not just a feeling of warmth. It's a feeling of this town changed my life. Before I did Groundhog's Day, I was the bald guy with glasses. After Groundhog's Day, I was the bald guy with glasses who was in Groundhog's Day. <laughs> Changed everything. I got to tell you, Sneakers, if you have not seen Sneakers, it is a great movie. Great, great movie. Great, great script. And it's amazing. It's a miracle when you think about it's a techno kind of uh, thriller kind of, kind of show where they have cradle modems. And it's still pertinent today. Completely pertinent. I, I remember... Um, I had so much fun on that show because uh, Phil 
Alden Robinson, who was the director, came up to me, and I was doing a lot of my scenes with Mary McDonald, and he said, Stephen, Mary is a bit uh, tight. Uh, do anything you can to make her laugh. Anything. <laughs> that was that was a fun few weeks. That we, we had so much, and Mary was always horrified at, at things I would do, and every take I did, I would. Whereas Groundhog Day, there was no improvisation. In Sneakers, all I did was improvise. I don't think I, I said very much at all that was in the script. And there's a lot that they cut out. That was too awful. But one of my, <laughs> my funniest stories of Sneakers was we shot on the Universal lot uh, at, for one section of it. So this is the cast of God. You've got Robert Redford, uh, James Earl Jones, Ben Kingsley, Dan Aykroyd, River Phoenix, Mary McDonald, Sidney Poitier. Oh, my God. I, I mean, it is just uh, David Strathairn. Great, great, great cast. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean. But I'm saying you have the greatest that Hollywood had at the time. And so those tour buses go through Universal all the time where they have the tour guides, and over here is the shark from Jaws. Oh, and there's E.T.'s bicycle. And, and they, they have their pattern, and they do it. They called us all to the set, and James Earl Jones and Robert Redford's trailer was on the other side of the road. And so I come out of my trailer, and I'm watching the bus go by, and the bus has to stop because Robert Redford and James Earl Jones are crossing in front of the trailer talking about the scene of what they're going to do. But the bus driver doesn't even realize this. Now, if you look to the right, you've got Columbo's car. If you, and everybody is photographing right, left, and the two biggest actors in the world are crossing in front of them, and no one noticed. It was hilarious. Uh, we have time for maybe two more questions. Let's. Oh, back there, yes, sir. Did not feel it on the set when the f movie was finished. People ask me that question all the time. I didn't feel it from Bill. I certainly didn't feel it from Harold Ramis, who was the greatest general, the greatest buoyant spirit at the middle of a movie, I couldn't even imagine there was any problem. But I, you know, I think there was tension between he and Andy. At least I got that idea from Andy, maybe. Uh, but you, I certainly didn't feel it on the set. I, I didn't at all. But I'm sure it was true to some extent because so much has been made of when Harold was dying and Bill went to meet him to try to make up with him, you know. It's a very stressful profession, and, and people say and do things they shouldn't do. Yeah. Uh, one more question? Yes. We heard today that it took a full week to shoot the net scenes at the corner. Any stories that you recall from shooting? Well, this is something I've mentioned before. It's a trick question because, yes, it took three weeks to shoot all of the Ned Phil scenes, but it was because uh, Harold Ramis had not decided what the day of the movie would be. So we, Bill and I had to shoot it, the same scenes in every weather condition. So we shot it in the snow, in the rain, in the sleet, uh, in the gloom, in the sun, everything. And at the end, uh, Harold looked at the footage and said, what we're going to do is we're going to make uh, the gloomy day, the day of the film, and when snow starts at the end is when time starts. So. That is why it took so long, because we were always shooting the same things over and over and over again in different weather conditions. I'll take, I'll take one more. Yes. What was it like working with Chris Nolan? Christopher Nolan. Uh, I loved working with uh, Chris on Memento. I, I worked with him there. He uh, covers everything. Uh, by that, I mean, as a director, he gets so many shots. Uh, and I was playing a man with amnesia, which is very difficult because as an actor, you have to remember what you do so you could repeat it from a different angle. So it really was the most challenging role I ever had in my life. Uh, because 
when you're sitting there, you think like, well, are you going to pretend you have amnesia? Or are you really going to put yourself in the place where you can't remember what you're doing? And then hope, when he shoots from another angle, cuts together. And I just ended up thinking that's his problem. So <laughs> I have to just I have to make it as real as possible and not help him. That's one thing actors need to learn to do is you're not there really to be in service of another actor or even of the director. You're there to be in service of that little spirit, that little part, that little life that's in the script. You have to bring that to life and you have to, in a way, meet with the director and so the demands of the direction and shooting of a show uh, co coalesce with your advocacy of who that character and who that part is. Uh, well, I want to thank you all. Uh, I'm going, uh, we're at the community room. Yeah, well, we're at the community room. If any of you want any books or anything or photos or autographs or anything, I see it's four o'clock just about. And so we'll go down because we're on a tight schedule on this Groundhog Day. Thing. But thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.